How's it going? It's great to see everyone here today. Uh, my name is Aditya, and this talk is titled Coral, Translating Go to Other Human Languages and Back Again. Uh, we'll get to what that first word, which actually isn't quite rendering properly on this uh, computer, uh, means a little bit later in the presentation. Um, first, I'm a systems engineer at Stripe, which means that my job is to write open source software for monitoring and reliability, which happens in Go. So I've been writing Go full time for the past five years, and a lot has changed in that time. This is from the source code of the Go 1.0 compiler back in 2012, which is when I started writing Go. You don't actually write C uh, regularly. There's a lot of unfamiliar stuff there. You might be able to get a sense of what's going on and what's happening, but not completely. And it would be much harder to actually write this yourself than it would be uh, to read it. This is a huge barrier to contributing to the Go project, and everyone recognized it. I mean, think about it. We're here to contribute to the Go project. We already you know, know and, and write Go, we need to murder to contribute to Go, so why should we need to learn a different language, C, just to, just to contribute to Go? And so we rewrote the entire Go compiler from C to uh, C to Go, which was released in 2015. And we did that largely with a C to Go translator that translated the code automatically, and then the remainder was done by hand, little tuning fixes here and there. There's a great talk from the very first GopherCon uh, about this. But that only removes one language barrier, and there's still one more to contributing to Go. Go development happens almost entirely in English. And that's true both of the official Go project, but also of other popular projects that, that use Go, like Docker, Kubernetes, and Grafana. So a person's ability to contribute to those projects is greatly limited if they don't have a working grasp of English already. The same way that your ability to contribute to the Go project back in 2012 would have been greatly limited if you didn't already have a working grasp of C. So even reading the code and understanding what things like char and scale mean, that's, that's something you and I might take for granted, but for some people, just reading the Latin script can be an extra challenge. And computers are here to make our lives easier. So let's see what computers can do to fix this. Now, in the Go community, we already have lots of people who don't speak English as their first language, or very fluently, or even at all. So, for example, the Chinese Go community has translated the official Go documentation into Chinese, and that's complete with the iconic Go, uh, Go for mascot. There are also other projects you can find on GitHub where the README, the comments, all the issue tracking, everything happens in Chinese. And last year, uh, GopherCon Brazil happened. That was a, confer a bilingual conference which had a separate talk, some, some in English and some in Portuguese. So it's great that Chinese and Brazilian Gophers have developed these providing communities for themselves, but fragmenting resources is bad for open source development. We know that fragmentation leads to duplicated work and incompatible interfaces. So we want to find a way to bridge these communities. The idea of eliminating natural language barriers to programming isn't new. In fact, it's very old. Grace Hopper was one of the first computer scientists, and she wrote the very first compiler for a high-level programming language. The language that she invented was called COBOL, and the goal was to have English-like natural language syntax that business executives could write code. And she received incredible pushback about that. Uh, about that. The engineers were furious. They thought, well, non-engineers can write code. That's going to put us out of a job. But actually, her vision went even, even further. It was more radical. She said, why should we restrict this to English-like syntax? What if engineers who spoke other languages wanted to write programs? She wanted COBOL to be, and I quote, a language you can use to talk to programmers around the world. And the response to that was even more vitriolic. They said, well, how can we teach American computers to run German programs? <laughs> and to be clear, this is not a question of how they do it technically. This was a decade and a half after World War II, so the threat of uh, the fear of threats from Germany and Russia was still very strong in people's minds. But even if Hopper's idea was put in the back burner due to xenophobia and politics back in the 1950s, we can look at what it means today and learn from that approach. This is Hopper speaking about COBOL many years later. She said, I would have thought COBOL would be useful to NATO because they had the common verbs for the things they were going to do. And the nouns they just have to have a dictionary for things they were referring to for inventory control. They have common nouns throughout NATO, and they can make a dictionary of common verbs and translate the program. 
You could write one in English, and you could translate it, and it could go to the other language. No problem, you'd have communication. It would be a limited vocabulary. Now, interestingly, Hopper chose the imperative mood for this specifically because she believed that it would be universal to all languages. Not all languages distinguish between present, past, future tenses, but languages typically have a way of commanding people to, to do something. And COBOL was one of the first languages which popularized imperative programming style, so this has stuck with us to today. Notice how even in Go, keywords and function names take the imperative move. That is indirectly a result of this tradition. And just as a separate aside, Go also takes one other uh, inspiration very directly from COBOL. Does anyone know what it is? It's uh, the time parsing function. That's actually modeled after COBOL's picture statements. So, in any case, let's see what we get when we take those same techniques that we use to translate the Go compiler from C to Go and apply them to Hopper's vision. So to answer this question, we can look at Coral. And I'm presenting off a laptop that isn't mine, which is why um, uh, I guess the font is rendering a bit odd. But uh, unless you speak Bengali, you probably wouldn't have actually recognized that. Goro is an extension of the Go compiler and toolchain to support Bengali. The name Goro is, is an idiomatic translation of the English word Go. I chose Bengali because it's the language that my family speaks. Uh, but more, to give some extra context, uh, after Hindi, it's the most common language that's spoken in India. It's, uh, it's also uh, spoken in, uh, it's also the national language of Bangladesh, which makes it the seventh most widely spoken language in the entire world. But nothing that I'm presenting on today here is unique to Bengali. So you can, and I would highly encourage you to, to go home and do this with, uh, with your own uh, languages that you speak. This is a you know the familiar Hello World program that's uh, that's written in uh, in Go. And then here is that exact same program, but uh, translated into Coro. Now we've left the identifier names intact, but all the keywords are are now in Bengali. And yes, uh, in case you're wondering if I missed something, true is actually not a keyword in Go. People are oftentimes uh, surprised when that. But before we get into the question of automatic translation and uh, um, switching back and forth, which is you know, the promise of this talk, we have, a, we, have a, we have a bigger problem. The Go compiler isn't going to know what to do with these keywords. We need to make the compiler able to run. So fortunately, Go's source code is all UTF-8. So the compiler has no trouble dealing with non-ASCII characters in Go programs. And remember, the Go compiler itself is written in Go now, so the Go compiler is just a Go program. Which means that the Go compiler has no trouble dealing with non-ASCII keyword definitions, at least in theory. There are a few internal checks that ensure that non-Latin and non-alphabetic characters are excluded from keywords, but it turns out that you can just disable those, and there, there isn't any issue. So we just extend the Lexer to handle the Bengali translations of each of these keywords, and we just add it to the map like this. And so this is all done purely in the Lexer. The parser has no idea that anything has changed. By the time that the, uh, the code actually gets to the parser, it's still, it's still exactly the same. So that's something that you, that's an approach you can't actually take with most other languages, because most other languages use flex-based Lexers. And Flex is, is a nice piece of software, but it's pretty ancient, and it doesn't support multi-byte code points. So you can only use ASCII for it. So there's a reason that I'm giving this talk at a Go conference, and not at, say, a Python conference. And it's true, I love Go. I've been writing it for five years now. It's my main language. But this is actually something that you literally cannot do in most other languages. You can't do this in Python, not so easily. You have to mess around with how the parser actually touches the code as well. And even the original Go compiler, which is written in C, would have had a much harder time with this. Uh, it's only Go 1.5 onwards where we can take this incredibly beautiful and simple approach to extending, uh, the, extending the language and adding, uh, adding alternate keyword variants. And so by the way, some of these uh, translations were straightforward, but some of them are really fun, like fall through. Um, so for those of you who speak languages other than English, try and think about how you might translate uh, Go keywords into uh, those languages. It could be a fun exercise. But so how I made those changes, here's what the Hello World program looks like in practice. So you can 
to prove you can actually see that it runs. There you go. Hello, world. Thank you. I think this is the first time that I've actually presented a Hello World at a conference and gotten applause for that. <laughs> but remember, our goal is to defragment the open source community, not to fragment it even further. So we want to make sure that our code is still going to be interoperable with code that's written by English-speaking code developers. And we don't want to have to translate every program manually. That would take a lot of time and effort. We want to be able to do something like what C2Go did. So fortunately for the translation step, Go already has a handy utility for formatting source code, Go Format, which hopefully you use. Now more, normally we think about it as preventing bike shedding over things like tabs versus spaces. So instead of arguing over the proper way to format source code, everyone just sets up their editor the way they want. If I want to use four spaces for annotation and you want to use two spaces, that's fine. We can still work together. This is, you know, it's a big world. We, can, we just set up our editors the way that we want, and then before committing our code, we run Go Format, and it translates it for us automatically. So we don't even need to be aware that we have different indentation preferences, because the code gets committed in the standard form, and our editors are smart enough to display it the way that we want. But Go Format can handle a lot more, too, like removing unnecessary parentheses, if you pass it like the dash S flag. And it's syntax aware, so it's smart enough that it will never change your code semantics. Which is another way of saying that it's a great way for performing fully isomorphic translations of source code. So we can extend it and repurpose it for translating English Go code into Bengali or Bengali Go code into English. And that's what Poro format does. Now again, most languages don't actually have these tools for performing isomorphic translation of source code. You, there are ways to do it, like you, know, you can use something like Rubocop or Ruby. Um, there are hacks, but they, they aren't perfectly syntax aware um, because most languages aren't perfectly um, homo-iconic, so you can't actually get that guarantee. Go isn't homo-iconic, but it does have this tool that was built in and designed into the language from the very beginning. That's what makes Go unique. So let's translate Coro back into English-speaking Go. So we start off with the Coro Hello World, and Coro Format, you can see, dumps it back into English. And if you, you know, don't believe me that that's a Hello World that runs, we can write it to a file again and, uh, and actually run it with the standard Go to the train. Again, Hello World. I don't get applause for the second time as I have. <laughs> so the same way that you didn't know I was using four spaces and I didn't know that you were using two, having bi-directional translation layers means that we don't need to, you don't need to be aware that I'm writing my code in English, and I don't need to be aware that you're writing your code in Bengali, or Portuguese, or, or whatever language. We can localize our source code as a commit hook, the same way that we use commit hooks to format it. So as a developer, Coro means that you only ever need to read source code in your own language. And as far as the code is concerned, our language preferences are no more of a barrier between you and me working together than our indentation preferences are, or our editor preferences. And that's the way that it should be. So we've translated the keywords at this point, but you'll notice that we didn't touch everything, like package names and variable names. And so a lot of ink is instilled in the topic of choosing good variable names. The one thing that everyone agrees on is that they should be both descriptive and concise. And then they disagree about what descriptive and concise mean, but and we'll not get into that. But before we even before we even argue about what descriptive or concise is, I think we can agree that if we leave the variable names in English, that's not going to be very descriptive to someone who doesn't speak English. So we want to be able to translate these as well. And fortunately, in reality, many variable and function names are already highly structured. As Hopper mentioned, we already have the verbs that we use quite frequently when writing code. We just need that dictionary that NATO has to translate back and forth. So we can take advantage of this knowledge and translate those in the translation step as well. Go format already gives us the basic building blocks to break renaming transformations like these as long as we have that dictionary that we, that we want to use. So by being a little bit more conscious about these conventions that we're already using, we can make our code much more accessible to people, uh, to, to non-English speakers. 
we might not, we don't get all of the translations for free, but we can still get many of them. And it, these are just a few examples, like of the of the patterns that you'll see in Go code. Like how many, they think off the top of your head now, how many methods do you have that um, or have you seen or used that start with the same few words over again, like read TCP socket, you know, read socket, read uh, read handler, or write you know write whatever. We can we can translate them. There's nothing that's actually getting in our way. Now, for many of us, coming to Go meant getting used to uh, a completely different style of error handling. So instead of throwing exceptions, we now return errors. And unless you're coming from a C background, that's that's going to be pretty foreign to you. And even if you're coming from a C background, it's new to be returning a special type as opposed to an integer value. So it's true that that does take some getting used to, but eventually we learn that there are some amazing advantages to this approach. So as Rob, Rob Pike's blog post, uh, errors are values, shows us. The, the principle that errors are values can mean a lot of things. It means that we can assign the return value of a function to a variable and then operate on that variable as a first class citizen of the language with the full expressiveness that Go gives us. It means that we can store that on, say, a struct field and record it uh, for later use and query it, uh, query it down the line. You can check out the scanner in the standard library, for example, what that looks like. Or we can take that error value and ask it what other interface types it happens to satisfy in addition to the error interface. Go's error handling is probably the most expressive error handling system of any language that I've, that I've used. It's right up there with common list. So I've spoken previously about um, interface types and error handling. Uh, so if you're interested in learning about more ways to take advantage of Go's error handling system, you can check those videos out as well. But for today, Errors that, treating errors as values lets us do something that's incredibly relevant to translating code as well. We can actually translate our error messages. Because in Go, the string that's returned by the error method is the only value that you are guaranteed to have available on every single error that you'll ever encounter. And moreover, it's considered bad form to try and parse this error string manually in, in your code in order to dispatch on it. And I would strongly agree with that. If you ever find yourself parsing the string, the, the string result of an error message, you really should step back and question the design of your code. So because it's already bad form to parse it automatically, that makes it all the more important for us to be able to render error messages in a way that's going to be readable and interpretable to the end developer. Because as developers, we've all struggled with cryptic error messages at some point. Now this is one of my favorites from Java. Cannot pass parameter type from type system.string to argument type system.string. Does anyone know what this actually refers to? Okay, good. Um, if, if, you, if you do, I'm, I'm really sorry because um, that probably means that you've dealt way more in terms of job than anyone really should ever have to. But before we, you know, before we uh, point point at job, you know, Go isn't a new to this either. Like, how many of you, without thinking, just you know, can think of a specific error message either in the standard library or in a third-party package that you torn your hair at over at some point? I know I have. Yeah. If you ever think that your coworkers are being too productive one day and you just want to throw a wrench in their day, ask on your company Slack what's the worst error message that you've ever come across, and you'll completely kill the afternoon for everyone. It's great. But the only thing that's worse than a cryptic error message is a cryptic error message in a language that you can't understand. And so error messages are a good starting point because not only are they finite in number, but translating them has a huge impact on your collaborators as well. So these are the easiest to solve from a technical perspective because we can use, addition, you can, we can use existing localization techniques. Many languages, including Go, already have libraries that assist with this. They'll provide variants of specific textual strings depending on the designated locale. They can even assist with things like uh, pluralization or other common operations that you'll need to do in order to treat things uh, for them to make semantic, you know, to be grammatically correct. So Go has the um, uh, very creative entitled Go I18N package, I18N being a common shorthand for internationalization. Uh, there are others as well that you can use uh, to, to achieve this effect. Oftentimes, internationalization is thought of in the context of uh, product development, but as open source developers, our product is our code, and we need to make sure that that gets internationalized as well. Now remember, our goal is to do this automatically. 
Now, translating error messages by hand is, is kind of fine, but uh, translating the documentation will require some additional uh, will require some additional work. And we want to be able to do this, um, we want to be able to do this automatically like we did with CDGO because otherwise that's just going to take too much time. Now, you might be thinking, uh, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only one here who's, who's amused themselves um, at some point by you know, translating something into another language and back again on Google Translate to see you know, how we'll stumble over um, idioms or, um, or, or words with multiple meanings. But it turns out that Google Translate can actually work quite well for technical documentation. If you ask Chris Cox, he'll tell you not to use C to go for other projects because it's not designed to work on all C code. It's designed to work on the type of C code that was written for the Go compiler, which is a very small subset. And similarly, we're not looking to translate all English to another language and back again. In fact, we're only looking to translate it to another language. And it's not all English, it's just our open source software. It's our code and the documentation. And so automatic, automatic translation of existing tools like Google Translate actually can work quite well for specialized technical text with narrow contexts. So for example, like let's uh, you know we can take a look at the documentation for uh, the pipe function from the uh, from the IO package. And so this is what it looks like when you uh, when you translate it into the Gulf. Um, now, I'll, I'll say that, yeah, this is actually a pretty good transition. It's not what a uh, native speaker would come up with uh, you know, if they did it by hand, but it does get the point of this. But, you know, keeping in theme with the title of the talk, let's see what happens when we actually translate this documentation back into English uh, from the product. So, the, I mean, the first sentence there is already, uh, or the first paragraph, um, uh, oh, did you have? No, okay. Um, so you can see some uh, you can see some uh, amusing um, like transliteration errors that happen with um, uh, with proper nouns, but yeah, it's true. Like you don't actually get the full meaning again. But we're doing we're doing a second step back here. This isn't something that we actually want to do with our documentation the way that we want to with our code. And the important thing is that we're getting the general uh, we're getting the general point of cost. We're getting the general uh, the general context. So, just for fun, and this is never something you would actually want to do in, in you know in real life. Let's see what happens when you add an extra language to the mix. Anyone interested in seeing that? So let's translate this from English into Bengali, translate the Bengali into Spanish, and then translate that Spanish into English. And yeah, I'm not going to say that this is the best you know this is the best documentation. I would not release this as you know the documentation for an open source project. But I will say that I have used open source projects which have worse documentation than this. <laughs> and I certainly have used open source projects which have had no documentation at all, which is currently the status quo for people who aren't, uh, who aren't going to be able to read uh, English. And that's what we have to beat. We have to beat the status, we have to be able to beat the status quo. And it's not a very high bar, we just have to do it. So there are a lot of different steps that we could take to including non-English speakers more in open source uh, code development. Now making tools for translating code and documentation to other languages, uh, like we saw here with Coro, is, is just one of them. So if anyone is interested in going home and, and making you know, their own variant of Go, like Coro, for a uh, language that they know how to speak, I'd highly encourage you to go home and do it. And take a look at Coro so you can see what the steps were and, you know, and save yourself uh, some of the work. The so some of these involve building new technology and tools to solve the problem, but others are more straightforward and low tech, um, and they involve the way that we operate as, as a community. We're just scratching the surface here. But for any of this to happen, we need to, be, we need to actually commit ourselves to doing it. That's the first and that's the most important step. And to, for that, we need to remember, we need to keep our eye on the broader picture. We need to remember that 95% of the world doesn't speak English as their first language. And 89% of the world doesn't speak English at all. That means that if this conference were perfectly representative of the world in every way, only 15 people would even be able to understand this talk that I'm giving right now. And of those, all but six would be listening to speak, we speak in what's for them a foreign language. 
So between we've seen uh, we've seen uh, that you know between UTF-8, which gives us the ability to um, uh, the ability to handle the entire breadth of um, the entire breadth of human uh, written language, and Go format, which is a unique tool that only Go has that can perform truly lossless syntactic transformations. Um, and by having a large community of bilingual speakers already, and I'm not just Chinese and Portuguese, but in other languages as well, you can see that there's no other language that's as well suited as Go is to being used by the entire world, not just those 5 to 10 percent who, uh, who speak English to varying degrees. We have an opportunity to bridge this language divide in a way that no other programming language has ever been able to. We can achieve that vision that you know, might have been impossible at out of reach and impractical back in the 1950s, but it is very much tangible and within our grasp today as Go programmers. So let's do it. Let's make Go the first programming language that's truly accessible to everyone, no matter what language you happen to speak. Thank you. Seems like you have time for one question. Do we get good enough to handle like manual translations in two different languages in order to specify language? I mean, that seems like a realistic thing to actually do. Um, yeah, I mean, there are a couple of ways I could think off the top of my head to do that. Um, I mean, obviously, go out of the box doesn't, but it would not actually be a very difficult uh, addition to, to get it to do that. Right. Um, and you consider right to left languages and how you would handle that? Oh, yes. Uh, the question is, uh, have you considered uh, right to left languages and how you handle that? So, um, so the answer is yes. From Go's perspective, that's actually not very difficult uh, because of because of the way that it treats the source code. So, uh, so one of my um, coworkers actually uh, tried to do something similar with Arabic. Um, and, uh, the, where you'll where you're more likely to run into um, issues are actually with the rendering of right to left languages because most terminals don't support right to left very well. Um, but from Go's perspective, like it, it, the program will work. It might not actually render the way that you want it to, but it will. The, from Go's perspective, the semantics are all still actually there, um, and that's that's an unfortunate thing that we, uh, as programmers, we, we generally don't do very well with. Um, mixing right to left and left to right. Uh, one funny example, um, I found this when I was uh, speaking at the Dubai a couple years ago. Try typing, try go to go for uh, google.ae and um, type in uh, a hashtag and, um, sorry, like type, if you search for a hashtag or a Twitter hashtag, um, the, the actual pound sign for the hashtag will appear afterwards in an autocomplete suggestion. Um, it does this backwards because it's thinking you're, you're, you want to look at um, the Arabic version, uh, so the hashtag has to come first, even though everything that you're typing is actually in English. Um, there are a lot of weird edge cases like that, and unfortunately, rendering is a whole other topic I could get into. It's, it's pretty hard to go. I think that's it. Thank you.